Good morning and welcome. My name is Sharon Kugler and I'm the Yale University Chaplain. It's a true privilege to assist with this service of remembrance, honoring those among the first women in Yale College who have died before they could mark this 50-year milestone. As I visited the extraordinary exhibit over at the Sterling Memorial Library last week, it was striking to see how much the first women who came to Yale to get an education actually educated Yale. What they endured, what you endured, and how you became the women whose remarkable minds and hearts have touched and improved the world is most humbling and deeply inspiring. The generations of women that have and will continue to follow you do not walk in your shadow. They are walking in your light. This morning, we have come together to carve out a little time and space to nurture our hearts. There's much to celebrate outside of these walls, and yet we are also mindful that our circle of celebration is incomplete. In the midst of the festivities of this weekend, our hearts also ache. There are pieces of us, sisters, who are missing. For a little while, we will take some time to pause in loving remembrance for those who have left this earth and are not here to share in the many facets of this weekend. We miss their voices here, and we honor their memory as being part of the first. Let this space be a comfort to you as your thoughts drift wherever they need to be. May you feel welcome to participate in any way that brings you a sense of peace in this moment. We have brought together different elements for this service. There's much music to soothe some spoken word in poetry, prayer, and prose, a lovingly curated backdrop, and most importantly, there'll be quiet time and space for you to hold yourself and one, of, and one another gently as you remember those who have died. We have lit a candle to bring light to each name. Some of our sisters left very young. Others had more life, more decades. I invite you now to breathe in and out, to be fully present in this space with yourself and one another. Let us begin.
In Blackwater Woods by Mary Oliver. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. We will be reading from the First Covenant, Psalm 90. I will read the first line, and we'd ask you to respond in the italicized lines. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, O mortal ones. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass which is renewed in the morning. Teach us to number our days that we may receive a heart of wisdom. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands together. O Lord, establish the work of our hands. Amen.
The Continuous Life by Mark Strand. What of the neighborhood homes awash in a silver light, of children hunched in the bushes, watching for signs the grown-ups will surrender, signs that the irregular pleasures of moving from day to day, of being adrift on the swell of duty have run their course. O oh, parents, confess to your little ones the night is a long way off and your taste for the mundane grows. Tell them your worship of household chores has barely begun. Describe the beauty of shovels and rakes, brooms and mops. Say there will always be cooking and cleaning to do. That one thing leads to another, which leads to another. Explain that you live between two great darks, the first with an ending, the second without one. That the luckiest thing is having been born. That you live in a blur of hours and days, months and years, and believe it has meaning. Despite the occasional fear, you are slipping away with nothing completed, nothing to prove you existed. Tell the children to come inside, that your search goes on for something you lost, a name, a family album that fell from its own small matter into another, a piece of the dark that might have been yours, you don't really know. Say that each of you tries to keep busy, learning to lean down close and hear the casual breathing of earth and feel its available languor come over you, wave after wave, sending small tremors of love through your brief, undeniable selves into your lives and beyond. My bad. Let us remember and give thanks for those of our classmates who have died and who blessed us by their presence in our lives. From the class of 1971, Karen Hamady, Cynthia Jordan, Karen Katzman, Kathy Coonan, Ellen Lerner, Daryl Pollock, Marcy Roseman, Merle Roth Rubin, Christina Zuni, Girlotka Winings. from the class of 1972. Anita Dixon. Maurice Baptiste Edwards. Gail Frischman. Sarita Wardlaw Henry. Anya Hilliard. Susan Lifshitz. Marjorie Marks. Elizabeth Montgomery Hines, Sherry Nichols, Pamela Horton Oliva, Judy Radspinner, Evadna Flip Zanikas, Rosanna Sapp. From the class of 1973, Jocelyn Chang, Jane Curtis, Stephanie Hill Fish, Lisa Goldberg, Krista Hansen, 
Gail Horowitz, Olga Howard, Allison Boucher Krebs, Susan McClure, Susan O'Connor, Diane Poen, Daryl Sneed, and Deanne Strauss. Um, is uh, Elga's daughter Lauren with us? It's truly been a transformative weekend to be here with you all. I hope you'll bear with me for a few minutes in this wonderful ceremony so I can tell you a little bit more about my mother. My mother lived her early life in Berlin, Germany. To understand my mother, truly you had to understand her mother. She was an amazing woman, Lisa Steinhardt's. As early as 1930, she realized that the family would eventually need to leave Germany, and she started to plan. Part of that planning included hiring a British governess for my mother and her younger brother so that by the time she came to America in 1936, at the age of 12, she was fluent in English. She had lived, learned English in three years. I read from her journal. 1933 came into my sheltered middle-class childhood as a welcome diversion. My parents, suddenly preoccupied with daily developments for the first time, more or less abandoned my brother and me to the care of our kindermädchen. Only she now stood between me and independence. I still vividly recall the pleasure I derived by not eating what she put on my plate, by playing hide-and-go-seek, leading the poor girl to believe me lost and by defying the bedtime that had been rigidly established by my mother. My brother and I sensed an air of excitement in the house. She started school at a uh, Montessori, which was eventually closed by the Nazis. When the Montessori school was ordered closed shortly after Hitler came to power, I was enrolled in an elementary school run by the Jewish community of Berlin. I was thrilled. This was real school at last. Formal classrooms, regular recess, grades, and above all, homework. On the way home from school, I passed billboards with anti-Semitic cartoons. My good friend Susie and I were inseparable 12-year-olds in 1936, quite accustomed to being barred from our favorite parks by signs proclaiming for Aryans only. By the time we arrived after a six-day crossing of the Atlantic, I was delighted to step ashore in New York. Susie went to England rather than America and an active correspondence was begun. September 1937. Dear Susie, I hope you don't think that I've forgotten you, but since I am in school, there's very little time to write. The high school is prima, first class. I have the choice of taking the academic course or the general course. I will take the academic course because I want to go to college. Because of this, I will take French and Latin instead of typing and stenography. I was able to choose between painting and music. I chose music. I will also take English, mathematics, physics, and social studies. 
That is geography, history, politics, all mixed together. Virginia Woolf wrote, for we think back through our mothers if we are women. Helen Epstein wrote the book, Where She Came From, about her mother's experiences in the Holocaust. I always felt protective of my mother because she had lost so many friends and family. I imagined what it must have been like because she hardly ever talked about it. She said she didn't remember. Helen Epstein wrote, I wore the clothes my mother made for me, read the books she read, valued what she thought good. I shared my life with her for a long time, long after adolescence should have ruptured the bond between us. I shared her loves, her disappointments, and her memories. She was the engine behind my energy, my defender when I needed one, my solace. When the break finally came, it was brutal. We came apart in a great explosion that required years to repair. In her last years, my mother lived in a retirement community in Lexington while my father was sinking into dementia. It was during that time and while I was living close by that my mother and I rejoined. We had a standing Tuesday dinner date. Sometimes I picked up my young granddaughter, her great -grand granddaughter, Alaria, from daycare and she joined us too. Our dinners were times of healing. My father died late in 2013. Shortly after, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. Her last weeks were a gift we shared with each other. In October 2014, I stayed with her while she received hospice care. She dictated these last thoughts to me as I sat in bed with her and as I knit a layette for her soon to be born second granddaughter, Nadia. Let's see if I can find it. November 2014. I would like my family and friends to know that I am grateful for the man I married and the parents I had. I could not be more appreciative of my three children and my seven grandchildren and my one great grandchild, Alaria, and my great grandchild to come. I wish everyone could be as lucky as I have been in having such a family and such good friends. I am appreciative of Brookhaven, where she was living. It has enriched the last years of my life with new friendships and activities. I have loved the times we all spent in Wellfleet. I have had a very scattered career, but I enjoyed all phases of, of it teacher, administrator, lawyer, mediator, and writer. It is time for somebody my age to move on. I hope that all of you will carry on the values I hold, peace and justice and equal opportunity. Elga Wasserman. She's buried in Grove Street Cemetery. It's a beautiful spot. Thank you.
we remember them. Please join for responsive reading the words in italics. This is by Roland Gittleson in the Gates of Prayer. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, in the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, in the opening buds and in the rebirth of spring, in the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of summer, in the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, in the beginning of the year and when it ends, when we are weary and in need of strength, when we are lost and sick at heart, when we have joys we yearn to share, so long as we live, they too shall live. They are now a part of us. Throughout the planning of this celebration, we heard from several first women who could not join us today because of illness, disability, or incapacity. Some are caregivers themselves or partners and spouses. As we honor the memory of those who have died, let us also remember those in need of our support, in need of a kind word, in need of a prayer. As you let the beauty and emotion fill your hearts during this song of healing, I invite you to send your most loving of thoughts to those who could not be here and pray their names quietly to yourself. Amen. We are coming to the close of this service, and I'd like to thank everyone who had a hand in its planning. 
The committee was hard at work across many miles, but always even as a distance with love and care in mind. Thank you as well to all those behind the scenes who handled logistics and forgotten details. None of this would have been possible without your patient touch. Deep gratitude to our readers and incredible musicians. Nicoletta, Yoon, beautiful Martina, you blessed us. Thank you. Truly, you gave us balm for our weary souls. Finally, to each one of you gathered here this morning, thank you for coming, for being present to each other while we lifted up the names of Yale's first women who have died. As you journey out of this space into the throes of continuing celebration and then back to your daily lives, remember the gift you were to Yale and trust that your brave light and steadfast pursuit of truth lives on today. Please know that you are welcome to stay here as long as you may need. Continue to share stories. Continue to share your remarkable selves. May you imagine a tomorrow where memories of your departed sisters rest safe and sheltered in the warmest of places, where hope is always abundant and sustaining to you. My friends, I bid you peace.
Thank you so much. One last invitation. If you had written a remembrance for a classmate, uh, you are welcome to come and take one candle. Um, please watch your step. Um, but we would love these candles to live in hope in your households. Thank you. <laughs>